Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the sermon this day is the Holy Gospel, the 18th chapter of Luke, especially these words of our Lord. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. In the name of Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ crucified and resurrected is good news preaching. It's good news preaching for you. On no less than five occasions in the Holy Scriptures, Jesus had preached of his once for all nations, crucifixion and resurrection. The preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ was uh, also picked up throughout the authors of the epistles and beyond. So that even St. Paul would write, we preach Christ and him crucified. St. Paul preached what Jesus had first preached. Jesus sees his upcoming crucifixion and resurrection in light of the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, His crucifixion and resurrection would be a fulfillment of what was prophesied by the prophets. You know from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah what the church should have expected in Jesus as the Messiah. Isaiah said that the Messiah would be a man of sorrows, that he would be stricken, smitten, afflicted by God, that he would be pierced for your transgressions, crushed for your iniquities, that the Messiah would be the lamb led to slaughter, and that the Messiah would indeed be the sin bearer of all people. And what about the Psalms? They too prophesied of the coming Messiah. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalmist would say of him, he was like a worm, mocked, lowly, derided. One of whom many would wag their head, strength dried up like a potsherd, his clothes divided by the casting of lots. Not only would his suffering and death be prophesied in the Old Testament, but most assuredly, his resurrection too. And maybe for us today, a little from the prophet Malachi, who said, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, that's the Christ, he shall rise with healing in his wings and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. All of this, indeed much more time could be spent this morning walking through the scriptures from Genesis through Malachi. But all of it meant to point to Christ, the one named Jesus, the one born of Mary. Every jot and tittle of it from Genesis through Malachi pointing to one and only one. His word, because it is his word, finds his fulfillment, its fulfillment in Jesus. And perhaps we should also add in Jesus alone. Jesus wanted to make it clear then, in his own preaching and in his own life, that unless 
he be lifted up upon a cross, he could be no Messiah. Jesus preached Christ. Jesus preached Christ crucified. And what he preached was an offense, a scandal to Jews. What he preached was foolishness to Gentiles. I suppose not much has changed as far as scandal goes. Cross-centered preaching, well, it remains offensive to some, and it certainly remains foolish to others. We are by nature, that is our sinful nature, not inclined to seek a Messiah like this. And even when we hear of the Messiah, we are so prone to change that Messiah into someone and something that he is not. Maybe we would rather have a happy, clappy Savior, a give you exactly what you want when you ask for it, Savior. You know, the kind of Savior that can turn all of your thorns into beautiful roses, a less offensive Savior. After all, how could we expect to preach Christ and Him crucified and actually get anyone to come to church? How can you market crucifixion? Here the psalmist, Psalm 146, put not your trust in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Rather, the church finds the Savior exactly where he was said to be, where he himself said he would be. We find him upon a cross. There the omnipotence, the greatness of God is made manifest for you and for your salvation, hidden, yes, but also revealed in the preaching of him who died upon the cross. For it is absolutely true that the power and strength of God is made perfect in the very weakness of the cross. The sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ, well, they employed the best of first century Roman torture techniques. Forty lashings minus one from leather straps that had these little pieces of bone attached to them. Yes, meant to tear the flesh. Brutal punching and kicking. The Lord was beat up before he even went to the cross itself. Shamefully spitting in his face and then the crown of thorns pressed upon his head. And if that wasn't worse or bad enough, that he was stripped naked before all to be seen, that he was mocked, that he was ridiculed, he was jeered at. And then came the cross, nails into his hands and feet, and then the weight, a long weight to hang on the cross. For you see that crucifixion was really death by suffocation. And then as St. John writes, for our Lord, he breathed his last and the spirit was handed over. That's crucifixion, that's suffering, that's for you. Jesus had repeatedly told his disciples about his Monday Thursday sufferings, his Good Friday death, and also his Easter Sunday resurrection. They would be eyewitnesses of the fact. They would see it firsthand. To hear about it makes us cringe, right? But it was necessary that they were there. 
It was required of them, in a sense, in a very important sense, that they would see what would happen and that they would listen to what was said. Not only were they there, but also many Jews and Gentiles who were in Jerusalem for the Passover, many saw it too. Isn't it interesting that while Jesus had preached this sermon five times, and five times recorded, who knows how many times he actually preached it, that they had the entire Old Testament, and yet the text says they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, wasn't it? They could not grasp, is this the Messiah? Is the Old Testament true? Did Jesus mean what he said? Yeah, they were true. And yes, he did mean what he said. Jesus wanted his disciples to know what was going to happen for now before the events. His little band of seminarians, well, they were strong and courageous for the moment. Maybe even a little cocky, we might say. You remember Peter, who openly bragged that he would never, ever deny Jesus. And then James and John, those great sons of thunder, proudly proclaimed they were willing to drink the cup of suffering that Jesus drank. But they didn't know what they were saying either. Jesus knew what would happen when the rubber hit the road, when the going got tough. In the midst of the trial and tribulation of suffering and ultimate crucifixion, he knew what would happen when the great passion began in the garden, Peter, James, and John, they would be too sleepy to watch and pray with the Lord while he prayed to his father in great sorrow, even with sweat that dripped like blood. And later, when Judas, who would betray him, and the soldiers came along with him, Peter would forget everything that the Christ had said about his kingdom not being of this world, that the church does not bear the sword. No, Peter would pick up the sword. He would cut off the ear of Malchus. He would try to live in the world as if the kingdom of this world mattered more. The disciples, they all ran away. One gospel includes that one was so nerve-wrecked, scared to death, he even ran off naked. Peter, the rock who had once rightly confessed Jesus to be the Christ, the son of the living God, would later deny him three times, cursing and saying, I do not know the man. Welcome to the church. It's a messy place, isn't it? Jesus knew that that would happen. The great passion, suffering, and crucifixion would be too much, so to speak, for his disciples to bear. But that doesn't mean that they get out of it. It was necessary that they see and are eyewitnesses of these things that they might bear witness of what they saw. Christ's cup of suffering, no doubt about it, should be rated R by the motion picture industry. It's gross. It's gruesome. Its scenes should absolutely call for viewer discretion advised. But in God's omnipotent wisdom, that's not his point of view. It's rated G by God, that is, general audiences. Everybody should hear the preaching of Christ and Him crucified. Do you recall what Jesus said? 
when the Son of Man is lifted up, a reference to his suffering and death by crucifixion. When he is lifted up, Jesus said, he will draw all men unto himself. The world must know of Christ who was slain for sin. You must know of this Christ and no other who is your Christ. And see these things as for you and for your salvation. Because there isn't any other way. There's no other way that you and I should know the gospel except in Christ and in, and in him crucified and in him resurrected. In the one who was pierced for your transgressions. The Christ whom the Father anointed with your iniquity. The Christ who knew absolutely no sin. Sinless. But obediently became your sin. For you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, unless one has faith in this Jesus, there can be no salvation. Immediately after Jesus delivers his sermon on his upcoming suffering and death, we have another little section in our text today. And it almost seems at first maybe it doesn't belong with this sermon. St. Luke tells of an annoying blind man who was there in the midst of the crowd and he was crying out words that I think are familiar to you. Lord, have mercy. Words which you have already cried out this morning. And his pleas for mercy must have been very annoying to those who stood around you can hear those in the crowd saying, be quiet, blind man, you're bothering us. The king of the Jews is parading by. This is a joyous event. We don't want to hear, Lord, have mercy. Much like a crying baby in an airplane or wherever we find disturbances from children, the blind man irritated his fellow parade goers. Let it not be so among us, dear friends. And as they tried to quiet him, he only cried out all the louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, recover my sight. Wow. It was a prayer born of genuine faith. A faith created a faith sustained in hearing Christ crucified preaching. And what did Jesus have to say to him? Words of resurrection. For Jesus said, see again, your faith has saved you. This morning, the church gathers together on Quinqua Jesima Sunday, the last of the three Jesimas. I think it's fairly easily translated. It means 50, the number 50, five, zero. Why? Well, because today the church is exactly 50 days from the annual fest festival of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why. In other words, the church anticipates this festival. And while the church anticipates this festival, the church also prepares for Lent, Ash Wednesday, beginning this Wednesday. In other words, that the church might rightly celebrate the festival of the resurrection of Jesus, the church must first meditate and think upon, hear the preaching of Christ crucified in Lent. Really, we need to hear it every Sunday. Today, we hear 
of Christ and him crucified, but we also hear of him resurrected. And because Jesus preached it this way, I think that we ought to see it as two sides, so to speak, death and resurrection of the same coin. That the Jesus who conquered death with crucifixion is the one who has paid for our iniquities. That the Jesus who rose and is resurrected and lives as true God and true man today did so for our justification. For you and for me who are baptized, we were baptized into Christ's death. We were baptized into his resurrection. Those who are brought to the baptismal font are brought blind, dead, and enemies of God. And God does some pretty awesome things there. In your holy baptism, God bespeaks you righteous with water in his word. In baptism, you die with Christ. In baptism, you are raised up with him. Not just sort of the head knowledge or some sort of abstract theology, but a reality for the baptized. That you are sealed for the great day of the bodily resurrection, meaning that though you die, you shall live again. The bodies of the baptized dead lie in graves today. And perhaps your body will one day too. Your eyes will not be able to see in that day. Your heart will not beat. You'll be dead. But dear friends, only for a little while. For you have been destined for resurrection. Now, during this little while, we receive what Christ wants to give to us. We live in our baptism, confessing our sins and hearing absolution from those who have been called to give it, namely your pastor. We gather as the baptized around this altar. Why? Because Christ desires to give you something. His body crucified and resurrected, his blood crucified, resurrected for you today at this altar. Christ desires to meet with you here because in and with this gift, he promises in his own testament given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Therefore, you and I look forward to the gifts that God gives now, even as we look forward to the resurrection of our own bodies and to be with Christ resurrected for all eternity. Viewer discretion, I suppose it is not advised this Lenten season. And yet let all Think upon, meditate, and believe with true faith the preaching of Christ and him crucified this Lenten season, indeed every season. Stare deeply into the cross today. See his anguish for you, yes. See his shame for you, yes. See also his resurrection for you. And in this way, See his love for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please rise. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.